okay, we're going to have these categories of compliance. Because what bothered me from the very beginning, and because I was part of a lot of the initial funding for some of these projects as well, is the fact that one sparrow does not a summer way. I really did not want to see the type of unidimensional projects get funded. So that I could easily see, and I'm, I'm just um, telling tears out of school eh, because I've actually seen some government proposals in some other Caribbean countries where you can have a water harvesting project because everybody knows water harvesting is part of climate smart agriculture. So you have a big water harvesting project and making the same type of mistakes that the World Bank always made in thinking that you can have an irrigation project. There's no such thing as an irrigation project. There's a water management project. Because having harvested all this water from whichever source, you then go to provide it to farmers who are using agrochemicals who are then going to go and pollute your water resource through the line. Mm -hmm. So part of the thinking in this was, how do I find categories of compliance that are mutually supportive and that I have intentionally given equal status? This is one of the major comments I got from the reviewers of the, of the proposal. Eh? Why are you giving all these categories equal consideration? One, to force the holistic approach, and two, because of the way it's crafted, and I have to take the credit for that, the way it's crafted, some of them are mutually enforcing. So even though when I discuss it, I, I may talk about land clearing under a biodiversity heading, land clearing also comes up under resource utilization heading, so that you find it cancels out eventually, at least in the, in the one project that I've actually reviewed, that actually came up with a CSAC week. So let me just give it to you in a, in a nutshell. So I have these five categories of compliance, where I say I'm looking at resource conservation. Resource conservation, energy use, you know, every time you talk about climate change, it's always about energy use and fossil fuel use, etc. Safety, which is an aspect that tends to be missing from a lot of the concerns. And it's part of my old bugbear, my old soapbox about food security. Because a lot of the things that are passing as food, not only is it safe, they're nutritious either. So that we shouldn't really be giving an equal weight to genuine, um, genuine safe food. Biodiversity support and greenhouse gas reduction. Now, I'm telling you all of this in a spirit, but each of the categories are further subdivided like this. You have these five major categories. You have four subdivisions, each of them, and each is worth five points on the CSAT scale. So if you were to score five points in each of the 20 possible areas for awarding of points, you will end up with an overall rating of 100 points. And I decided, quite arbitrarily of course, because it's my tool that I made it, I decided that if you couldn't muster up 40 points, in other words, if you couldn't have a two point rating in each of the categories, then it's not really a climate smart project. We shouldn't even be talking to you. If it's between 40 and 49 points, that's a CSAT level one level of certification. If you look at the program, you'll see the actual CSAT designation, which is the trademarked stamp that will go onto the project, the, the, the product, or the, or the process. A level two CSAT certification will be 50 to 59 points. Level three, will be 60 to 69 points. Level four will be 70 to 79. And level five will be 80 to 100. Now, as we talk about it a little more, you realize that it is going to be extremely difficult to accidentally craft a CSAT three or four level project. Forget five, a three or four level project. Because if you are focused only on water harvested, or only on greenhouse gas reduction, you're going to find yourself in a bind. You may get the full 20 points for that section, but then have such poor land use 
have such poor safety, have such poor management of biodiversity that you fall aside and you end up with 40 points and don't even make, well, 39 points, sorry, and don't even make um, the, the overall CSAC certification as being authentic, in my view, authentic climate smart agriculture. So let me just quickly go through the categories and what are some of the things discussed in them. Under resource conservation, I've looked at land, water, nutrients, and labor. I know there are a lot of people in you know, human resource people who say, hey, you shouldn't be talking about people as a resource. But the reality is that when you're looking at inputs and resources to be used on it, um, labor is part of it. And that way I get to sneak in some of my other, you know, more socialist um, ideas. So that in the same way that Green Globe gives you extra award of points for having sourced your labor within the community. So if you look at at hotels with a green globe certification, they're, they're hiring from within the community. You're not bringing in a host of the expats from wherever else, you know, and, and that, that type of thing. Under <coughs> energy use, I've looked at power, lighting, input manufacture, because I am really wary of these climate smart agriculture projects that, you know, look fancy on the outside, but when you look at all the inputs, all the inputs have been manufactured using fossil fuels, the same thing that we allegedly trying to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And transportation. Under, under safety, I've looked at the production operations, harvesting, storage, and utilization. So that way I get to, again, my little socialist tendencies, I get to throw in a little with a nutrition argument into the utilization. Because one of the reviewers of, the, of CSAC is a colleague of mine, uh, Lisa Kitanoya, who runs the, the uh, Environment Foundation out in Ohio. And one of the things she has been saying all over the world is that in a major source of leakage and so is, is in post-harvest handling and the wastage, actual wastage of food. So I, I picked that up as well under waste when I, I just discussed that earlier. So under biodiversity support, which I know it'd be clear to the hearts of the niches and the and the, and the cows in the room. Land clearing. So what's what's the good of having a major water harvesting project when the original land clearing is on a, a watershed? I mean, I'm, I'm not just making this stuff up. Eh? Trust me, you can't make this stuff up. There are actual proposals like that. The first was go in there, cut down a watershed, you know to have a water harvesting project because they're going to divert some river from somewhere and some, something crazy like that. And I've, I've, been, I've been given new bona fides to talk about the water industry because uh, I recently did the strategic plan for, for Nawasa, which is the water company in Greater, and I was able to drum home to the, to the board and the management the importance, the climate change significance of water management at a national and regional level. Off-site agrochemical aspects. What happens, you know, it's one thing to see is supported by biodiversity here, there, and everywhere. You know, Limits to the introduction of invasive species. Because although I haven't specifically mentioned GMOs or the like, I'm, rec I'm in full recognition that some of the adaptations that we're going to have to use are going to be genetically modified. We are going to be halophytic and xerophytic modifications that we need to survive. So I'm not, I'm not on a, you know, I'm not on a total organic crusade. Eh? And then ecosystem services impact. And this is a, this is a term that I like. I mean, Carl will know that on is a right board. I am allegedly, supposedly, and not very effectively the head of the sustainable development chair, but the, uh, committee because. Really, we need to be selling some of these services. John Agard has been able to put together some of the economics of it in terms of how much this an acre of forest is worth. An acre of forest at a particular elevation is worth something to people living in Arima. Because we know what happens when you clear. We know how much water comes down, we know how much damage you can have, etc. 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 So those are that's part of the, the overall thinking. And then in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. I look at enteric fermentation, you know, your ruminants belching up the place. 
soil management. So again, another way to tackle that. So that's where I would say, although the, the point scale is equitable, uh, seems equitable, equal, but it's equitable in the long run. I look at fossil fuel use, project-wide. And I look at manure and waste management. And under waste, I'm taking byproducts, um, improperly harvested products, because at the key of CSAC is the manual, eh? the part that I haven't shared with you is the actual manual that says how you're going to now ascribe a scale, a, a, a numeric output for a question, an answer to a question based on these particular categories. Now, I knew I said it was going to be a long road to the CSAC too, but I really just wanted to give it the antecedents because a real examination of the tool, you know, will require you looking at, at the document that you, you may or may not have seen. But I, I just want to, to leave with a couple of statements. Having come up with this scale, having come up with a points awarding scheme that can be used by people without an agriculture background. When you see the manual, the manual lists answers to specific questions in terms of land cry. What it does is it forces anyone su submitting a project to actually go checklist-wise down each of these concerns. So if you were developing a water harvesting project and you didn't think about fossil fuel use at all, you have to know because that is going to be one of the areas that is going to come down with the checklist. The only project that I have actually done a CSAC evaluation on is Kent. Various project, albeit without his knowledge and without his permission, and, 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 without, and, without, and without any any hope of compensation to Kent himself, right? But, but I just use I use the idea of Kent's project, not his actual project, in terms of seeing what it would take for you to get an 80 or so ranking. So Kent uses renewable energy. In terms of manual management, he has his, his chicken production goes directly into your fish, your fish that you have for products, you know. And it's that kind of project that is going to satisfy the requirements of CSAC. And that tells me that I'm kind of on the right road because it means, it means that, you know, we are, we are looking at, at particular, particular kinds of development. I just want to to welcome my very good friend, the director of Arikot in the Cayman Islands, Adrian Eswick. Nice to you. Yeah, Sorry. we're talking about sure. small island development states um, and the kind of smart agriculture and so on. I, I neglected to mention the amount of time I spent in Cayman in terms of developing the, the training program for the very the largest nursery operation in the Caribbean at the time, yeah. where they were um, preparing nurseries for a, a major development. And here comes Karen. Perfect timing, Karen. They have been subjected to me for about 20 minutes. If you notice the expressions on all the faces. So that, you know, you're perfect timing. Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying, to be able to qualify, you have to go down this checklist. So if, if for no other reason, one of the reasons why I'm proud of this tool is that it forces project developers project fabricators, like myself, and project analysts to go down in checklist fashion into each of these categories and see where does this project process or product fall into the overall scheme of things. I'll tell you. Good. Yeah, yeah. 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 So as I said, when you, if you haven't seen the, the advanced release, I'm going to give you a, a copy of it before, before you leave. You can get a chance to rubinate on it and, you know, if you want to, to, to talk to me or to challenge me on any aspect of it afterwards, you know, please feel free to do so. But I thought it was important that I didn't just fling this CSAC thing at you without talking about the antecedents. Because I think the fact that I was willing to, to share the pre-release with people that I consider, you know, who I knew would, would put some sort of, you know, effort into analyzing it and telling some of the shortcomings. And I've been able to modify it in such a way that, you know, it's, it's still 
kind of the overall objective, which is to prevent greenwashing, to provide the region and, and scientists and professionals coming out of SIDS with a tool for which they will be suitably compensated. Because Green Globe is a brand out there. You don't get to be a Green Globe auditor by just staying over and saying you want to be a Green Globe auditor. So if this thing is going to take off, if it takes off in the way that I want it to and I anticipate that it will, if you're going to be using the CSAC method, you're going to be using it under license, and that you'll be using the manual, the manual is part of the package that you get for the license, apart from the stickers, the actual CSAC stickers, which will give the designated um, rate and so But you also get a package. So I foresee, if this thing goes to plan, that you'll have to be, I'll have to be training trainers in how you then interpret qualitative answers into a scalar process. So that is my, um, that is my fourth million plan. As you know, the first three didn't quite, quite work out, but I really think that we're making a fourth million of, 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 of this one. So I want to thank you for coming. Um, as I said, the, the really important part comes after this. Not just Chesney's presentation, but the, you know, the views from people who have had a chance to take a look at it and see you know, if, it, if it meets any or all of their expectations. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, as one of the non-experts in the room, I must say that the presentation was very much an education to me. Um, it's not the first time, of course, you've provided some education in my direction. Um, There's a vacuum there, so that's that, 17 that. in, in Durban. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, it was Steve who taught me that the cup um, also has a, a, a security <laughs> component, because as we sat in the back of a police um, Van in, in South Japan, Africa, and, and I looked over to Steve and I said, Steve, you know, there's probably another Steve who traveled in the same police van. Uh, 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 so I yes, <laughs> things didn't work out quite well for him. Yes, yes, so I learned yes. that the cop in Cop 17 yeah. also had to do with the police. And also learned that Steve Biko and Steve Maximilian are two yeah, different. Yeah, Steve Biko uh, and Steve Maximilian. Two different. Two different. Two different. But uh, to, 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 for the benefit of the rest of you who may not know about that situation, we were actually um, <laughs> provided free transportation in a, in a Black Maria in South Africa, in a white neighborhood, because these characters stopped a police van and said, you know, we hungry, looking for somebody to eat. <laughs> and when I use my very, 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 very uh, strong Trinidadian accent, the, 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 one of the policemen said, where are you from? <laughs> I said, I'm sure that, you know Brian Lara? <laughs> we, we went to school together. <laughs> so not, not, not only did he take us to the restaurant, but when, 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 we, pull up at the rest, when we pull up at the restaurant, the fellas wanted to buy beers for us for free because they said, ah, oh, the police is here. <laughs> so we had, we had, I mean, it was really, really interesting. It was really interesting uh, thing that event. But I mean, everybody had a Lara story, obviously, because we all went to school with them. <laughs> okay, okay uh, another person who has, who has provided a very much education in, in matters related to agriculture, food production, and development generally is Dr. Allington Chesney, who is here with us this morning and who is going to take us through a presentation on funding Climate Smart Agriculture. So Dr. Chesney, yeah. Yeah. invited.